Konnichiwa minasan. We're back again to bring you more Japanese learning goodness. We want to thank you for your support, comments, and criticisms. Some people have mentioned that it's a lot to take in at once, and it is. But it's not the end. When you immerse yourself in a language by, say, just translating every line of Pokemon Leaf Green, you won't understand everything at once. But over time, it'll start to click. Just stick with it and try your best. Before we begin, let's get a few things out of the way. First off, if you haven't watched the first video, do it. Otherwise, you won't know what we're talking about. Second, we're going to start doing some pop quiz style questions on our Twitter, so follow us there and answer our questions to stay sharp. Third, we've got flashcards ready for those who want to review more on their own on both Quizlet and Anki. Links below. So, let's get prepared by going over the rules. One, take notes with paper and pencil. You can even pick out a cool folder to put them in. I have a Disney Princess one. It's gorgeous. Two, have a dictionary handy. Try looking up words yourself and pause the video if you have to. Three, practice calligraphy. Write every word in its meaning several times so it really sticks like a munchlax on honey. And finally, have fun. And do note, I'm assuming you know how to read and write hiragana and katakana already, so go learn if you don't. And I'm not a native speaker and would not pass as one, so know that my pronunciation is not perfect, though I certainly try. Soro soro, hajime masu yo. Red wa Famicom mo shiteru. Right off the bat, we've got something very familiar. Wa, it indicates the topic of our sentence, which is Red, our character's name. That didn't change between episodes. Moving on, Famicom, short for Family Computer, is just the Japanese name for the NES. It was outdated long before the original Pokemon games came out, but Red here doesn't even have a dad, and his mom doesn't seem to work, so you can't expect him to have the latest gear. Wo tells us that we're manipulating the Famicom, which brings us to Shiteru. Shiteru is kind of the star of today's episode, and you'll find out why soon enough. In fact, you'll find out right now. Shite is the te form of the irregular verb suru. Suru is probably the most common verb in all of Japanese and means to do. It is so general use that you can often attach it to nouns to make them into verbs. Famicom wo shiteru. Red do Famicom. But what is the te form? I'm glad I asked. The te form is a conjugation that connects one word to another by adding a te to the first word. For example, above we have shiteru. See the te? It can be used to chain things together, whether it be a sequence of verbs, multiple adjectives, sentence clauses, all kinds of things. It can even be used to make requests and express regret, if the right verbs follow it. It is used a lot, so we're going to tackle it in chunks. But when the te form is combined with the verb for to be, iru, it is equivalent to English's present progressive, which describes what someone or something is currently doing. We have a present tense to be in iru, so we know that we're talking about being. I am, you are, and such. The te form of suru and the present tense iru are tethered together like knuckles chaotic, distinct yet inseparable. So suru is helplessly pulled along by the present tense iru. It's just like an English but flip flopped. Red is doing. Red do wa shiteru. Both have present tense forms of to be or iru. Right next to a verb that indicates the current action. Finally, we drop the e in iru because nobody has time for that. So, red does not do Famicom. Red is doing Famicom. Osuru is used for playing video games, sports, and other things. A close equivalent we have in English is dancing. Do the twist. Do the robot. Do the Mario. Dance the Mario dance sounds a little bit redundant, doesn't it? Another example is. Do the dishes or do the laundry. One more example of suru is, and allow me to indulge myself, the series of Japanese commercials for the Sega Saturn featuring Segata Sanshiro, Sega's Kurosawa parody advertisement character. The song ends with, like Segata Sanshiro's name. Shiro is the strong order form of suru, which we'll see more of in the next episode. But it's like saying, "Play Sega Saturn." Our sentence comes out to: Red is playing Famicom. Red wa Famicom mo shiteru. Yoshi, soro soro dekake yo. We've got another classic Nintendo reference as Red calls everyone's favorite green dinosaur into action. 
T. Yoshisor Munchakupas from the Mario series. That's right, everyone. In the original Japanese read, Yoshi accompanies the player throughout their entire journey. And you just got punked! Ha! No. Yoshi is just a word pronounced more like Yos. It's kind of like, all right, or yes. It even sounds like yes if you butcher it. Yos! A coincidence, I assure you. Besides, Yoshi's name is actually written and pronounced Yoshi. His name is Yoshi because if you listen closely, Mario shouts Yosh when he rides Yoshi in Super Mario World, and you've just got punked again! <laughs> I'm on a roll today! Soro Soro means slowly, gradually, momentarily, but more often than not, it's used to indicate to the listener or reader that there's an action the speaker will start doing or is already starting to do. And then, dekakeyo, from the Ichidan verb dekakeru, to depart. Ichidan verbs always end in ru, and we cut the ru off when we conjugate them. Then we replace it with a different ending, like equipping plates on Arceus to replace its type. Right now we're adding the yo suffix to change it to the volitional type, which means it expresses intent to do something, like let's. So we go from dekakeru to dekakeyo, let's depart. Another example would be taberu, to eat, which becomes tabeyo, let's eat. Godon verbs, on the other hand, change type by switching their oo sounds to different sounds. We saw this in the previous episode, when the oo became an e in order to become a stem verb, but they become volitional by changing the oo to o. We saw a volitional verb when Okido asked us to tell him about ourselves. He says, morao, from morau, to receive. But more importantly, it's accompanied by a te form verb, which is the formula for receiving a favor. Let's receive a favor. Okido intends to receive information about you. So all together, with our Yoshi, and our Soro Soro, and our Dekakeyo, we can translate this line to... Alright, let's get going. Yosh, Soro Soro Dekakeyo? So, ne. First off, Okasan means mom. Pretty cut and dry. She is our communal mother. She starts off saying, So ne, which is like saying, Oh well, but can also indicate agreement, like, That's right. And then Otoko no ko, which should be familiar. The no connects two nouns together. Using our normal method, it translates to children of men which, although being a fantastic movie, isn't correct. Remember that no also modifies the final noun with the one preceding it. So we have babies, which are men. The man baby. So, boys. And Itsuka means sometime or someday. That tabi there isn't our Japanese language editor, or a place, but rather a concept. It means journey or travel. Remember, I said that the particle ni can also be used in more abstract ways than just indicating pedestrian topics such as a place or direction, like telling time. In this case, we're going towards a concept, journeying. So there's still a destination, figuratively speaking, towards the journey. Deru means to leave or depart, so altogether it becomes to leave on a journey. Tabi ni deru. This mono is a tricky one. Usually, mono means thing but it can also mean person, depending on the kanji used. The problem is, we don't have kanji here, just kana. However, we know it means person, because the subject of Okasan's sentence is young boys, who are not objects. Notice that tabi ni deru is modifying the word mono, as verbs, and in this case entire phrases, do when put directly in front of nouns, which makes tabi ni deru mono mean people who go on a journey. The nano we see at the end is a fairly common way to end sentences in feminine speech. The no itself is put on the end to indicate that the sentence is explaining something. It's half just a more verbalized inflection of the voice and half actual grammatical feature. Men can use the no at the end of their sentences too, but wouldn't use the na. If men wanted to explain something like this, they'd usually end their sentence in dayo, which means the same thing as nano. When you put yo at the end of the sentence, it means you're telling someone something they don't know. I know what you're thinking. Isn't this kind of similar to being explanatory with no at the end? And yes, it is. But this is more emphatic, to the extent that it's also used to reinforce commands. Un means yes. It's kind of like a Japanese equivalent to 
Mm hmm. However, a longer mm hmm actually means no, sort of like uh uh. Terebi is derived from the word television. Apparently, it's too long for Japanese, just like it's too long for English. Go figure. Hanashi is the noun form of the verb hanasu, to speak, and is translated as conversation or speech. But in this case, because of the context, it's referring to a story, which we could translate as a story from TV. Not like grandma's stories, which you never, ever interrupt, but just any story. Altogether, we have our mothers saying, Right, boys are people who will someday embark on their own journey. Yeah, that's from a story that aired on TV. We've added some words because, even though they're not in the original text, the speaker is implying them, and thus, they're necessary for the sentence to make sense in English. Oka-san, so ne, otoko no ko wa itsu ka tabi ni deru mono na no yo? Un, terebi no hanashi yo? So yeba, tonari no okido hakase ga anata o yonde itta wa yo? We start off with so yeba. It means speaking of which or which reminds me. So we know that our mom is continuing from her previous train of thought. Anime fans will translate the next part pretty easily. Tonari no okido, okido. Tonari means next door or nearby, but since mom isn't giving directions to somewhere and okido is the name of the professor, the phrase is saying neighbor professor okido. Ga and o are particles we saw last time and we'll continue to see until the end of time. Ga refers to subjects, and bo indicates what the verb is acting upon. Anata is one of several ways of saying you in Japanese. It is used when speaking formally. Married couples will also refer to each other in second person as anata la, sort of like saying darling. Usually, however, people will just refer to each other by their names, titles, or even skip the reference entirely if it is easily understood who they were talking to. Anyways, our verb in this case is yondeta. That's kind of weird. Uh, the ta at the end suggests that it's past tense, but is that... Do, do I hear the sound of... Oh, oh my. The te form strikes back. That's right, folks. The te form is back. What? That's a day? Let me elucidate here. So last time we saw the te form, it was with suru, and it became shite, right? But suru is an irregular verb, and the conjugation rules for it are special. So what about everything else? Everything else follows special patterns that depend on which syllable the verb ends on. For example, verbs that end in nu, bu, or mu change their final syllable into nde in the te form. Working backwards, yonde could either stem from yo nu, yo bu, or yo mu. If we use our handy-dandy dictionaries, we find that yobu and yomu are verbs. Yobu we saw in the previous episode. It means to call. Yomu means to read. Both become yonde. But by using the power of context, we know that Okido Hakase wasn't reading us because he isn't a legilimens, obviously, but was calling for us. The te form combined with the past tense means that this action was being done in the past. It's a little different than just saying it happened in the past because there is a sense that it was ongoing and progressive. To translate it, instead of saying Oak called, we'll say Oak was calling. We cap it off with a yo, which we just explained. It's emphatic and new information, like yo, Oak was calling for you. Hey, there's also a wa here. Are you wondering what it is? No, it's not Okasan's Wario impression. It's something ladies can add to the end of sentences to make it softer, but also emphatic, and to emphasize how feminine the speaker is. Very feminine indeed. Though, guys can use it too, sometimes, uh, but only in places like the Kansai region and with different intonation, and it's used a bit differently, or if they live in other regions and they're not feeling particularly masculine, uh, you know what? We won't hear many guys using wa, so don't worry too much about it. In the end, we have, speaking of which, our neighbor, Professor Okido, was calling for you. So yeba, tonari no Okido hakase ga anata o yonde ta wa yo? Oh, would you look at the time. It flies by so quickly. Unfortunately, 
that's all the time we have for this episode. We're trying to keep things more manageable around here. You thought we were going to choose a starter? Think again. But next time, we'll definitely have a Pokemon join us. Probably. Maybe. In the meantime, you should like, subscribe, and share this video. Remember, we have vocabulary flashcards below, and on our Twitter we're asking quiz-style questions, so you can stay fresh on everything you learn between videos. Thank you everyone so much, and see you next time!